Well, welcome everyone to the first of the research seminars in the School of Political Science and International Studies for 2016. Uh, as those of you who've been to these before know, we use the research seminars as a way of showcasing the best research that's going on not only in the school, but also from across Australia and also uh, very often internationally. Uh, and it's in that context that it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Paul Muldoon, who I've known for, actually I can now say for a, a very long time. Uh, and, uh, and Paul is a, a political theorist uh, at Monash University who works, specialises in issues surrounding questions of justice, indigenous politics, uh, restorative justice, uh, and Australian history. Uh, and I think for those of us who know uh, Paul's work, and that's um, many of us given the interest in these issues in the school here, one of the things that distinguishes his work is the ability to bring the political theory together uh, with an engagement with really key fundamental issues uh, to do with in a sense, Australian politics, Indigenous politics, um, as, they're, as they're developing at present. And I, I would say one other thing that has really struck me about Paul's work over the years is that, and I don't think uh, many academics can, can claim this, but Paul writes beautifully. So not only is his work uh, very insightful, but it's also a real pleasure to write somebody who has uh, such a command of the craft of writing and and, uh, and in that respect although we're going to hear him today you better not let me down <laughs> uh, uh, it's wonderful to, to have uh, Paul here and I'll turn it over to him speak Thank for about uh, 40 minutes and then we'll have a question and answer Okay, thanks Chris I will now proceed to mumble my way and be inarticulate through this whole paper <laughs> just to disprove everything Chris has said thanks for inviting me it's great to be up here and to uh, be given this chance to kind of run through this paper, which I fear might be a bit long, so uh, I'll cut out bits of it that I think are irrelevant. But just I'll start off by talking a little bit about the title, which is a little bit weird. Um, the paper owes its origins to a workshop that I was running in South Africa where we gathered together some people to reflect upon the reconciliation process there sort of 20 years on, the benefits of hindsight um, and to get what we assumed would be their sense of disappointment with it, and that's pretty much what came out of that workshop. But about a day before we were running this, uh, the team of researchers that I was there, we said, well, we need somebody to talk about what's going on in Reconciliation Australia and how that history unfolded, and Paul, you should do that. And so then I rushed back to my hotel and thought, why is this me? In, the, in that kind of mad panic of trying to scramble something together in 24 hours, a kind of narrative about the history of reconciliation in Australia... I went back and had a look at the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation Act of 1991 and read the preamble and came across this phrase where it said that despite the fact that Aboriginal people had been dispossessed of and dispersed from their traditional lands, that it was unfortunate that there had been no process of reconciliation in Australia and that it was most desirable that there be such a process of reconciliation by the Centenary of Federation in 2001. That word, desire leapt out at me for the first time. I must have read it many, many times, but I hadn't ever thought about the question of reconciliation in the context of desire or through the lens of desire. And so it did start to get me thinking about what was actually behind this desire for reconciliation, at least among non-Aboriginal people in Australia. Okay? How were we to think about desire? So the paper became very much uh, focused on the relation of affect and politics, okay? desire and politics, affect and politics, and as I went back and had a look over the debates over reconciliation again, one particular affect just kept jumping out, and that was shame. Okay. Now, shame is particularly prominent. I'm going to say a little bit uh, more about it. In the debates over reconciliation, particularly from people on the left, shame was seen to be a central driver of the reconciliation process, and there was an assumption that it had a very strong connection to justice. Okay? In other words, that we could back shame to deliver a just outcome. Okay? Um, I started to think a little bit more about that, to trouble a little bit more about it, and that led me to kind of explore what I thought was then a hitherto um, under-examined connection between shame and narcissism. Okay? So... This paper is really about trying to look at reconciliation through the lens of narcissism. Um, and I do a brief foray into psychoanalysis. It's my first foray into psychoanalysis, so you have to be gentle with me when I go through some of this. Um, but 
the idea, I think, behind it, I'm, I'm not sure that I really kind of shake preconceptions about reconciliation here, but I do want to defamiliarize the concept to us because it is overwhelmingly seen as being highly desirable. You know, reconciliation hasn't been subjected to a whole lot of critical uh, analysis or critical treatment. So the broad claim, I guess, of this paper is that if we recognize some of the narcissistic dimensions of reconciliation, that it might open up some grounds for resisting that as a movement. And partly doing this in the context of a debate over constitutional recognition for Aboriginal people, which once, is once again being framed as another step in the process of reconciliation. Okay. But as you'll get to see, the paper is not an unequivocal denunciation of the narcissistic impulse uh, in reconciliation. In fact, the paper tries to wrestle with what I think is an ambiguous uh, element to uh, the narcissistic drive in reconciliation. I think it is something that drives the restorative project in Australia, and I also think it's something that compromises on the capacity of that project to deliver on its promise. The paper unfolds in three parts, really. I spend uh, a little bit of time, because this is written for an international audience, talking about the history wars in Australia, which I probably don't need to rehearse uh, all that much. I'll just say a couple of things about it, because we all lived through it. Uh, a second section of the paper is on shame uh, and its subterranean connection with narcissism, and that's where the real work of the paper happens. And then in the final section of the paper, I try to reevaluate the apology to the stolen generations through that kind of narcissistic lens. And in particular, I'm trying to look at the way that narcissistic impulses compromises the ethical potentiality of those kinds of acts of atonement uh, like apology and I think there's this kind of competing elements at work in the apology there's this desire to make amends and it runs alongside a desire to make innocent as well to re-innocent the Australian polity okay. so quickly uh, into the history wars Obviously, I don't want to say too much about this other than that the obvious point, that they were never really a question of a war about historical facts. Yeah? The, the history wars were never fully insulated from questions of national identity, and so what was characteristic about these kind of history wars, as far as I can tell, is this kind of constant slippage between historical truth and ideological assertion. And the whole of the history wars became, I think, refracted through a nationalist lens, and so we were seeing everything through the framework of pride and shame. Yeah? Do these events actually lead us to be proud of our nation or do they lead us to be ashamed of them? Okay. Geoffrey Blaney's 1993 Latham Lecture, which became a kind of lightning rod in this regard, where he said, OK, we've had the three cheers view of Australian history up to now, uh, and that's been wrong, but now what we've got is the black armband view, and that's equally wrong. And he said, this just presents Australian history as if it's a saga of shame. Okay. All right. I think the real catalyzing moment in the History Wars, was the Bringing Them Home report. Um, and primarily because that single word genocide was introduced into the debate at that moment. Um, and it becomes very difficult, I think, to sustain a positive image of a nation once you start to accuse it of genocide. <laughs> it's this pause. Yeah. <laughs> swallow that one. Yeah, swallow that one. Okay. So just quickly, so predictably the National Inquiry into um, the removal of Aboriginal children proved to be flammable material for the history wars. Concerned to defend the reputation of the nation, Conservatives declared that bringing them home was one of the most irresponsible documents in recent memory, and they set about undermining the credibility of the Commission, the methodology of the inquiry, the testimony of the Aboriginal witnesses and the merit of the recommendations. Okay. Claiming no interest other than truth itself, and this was a mantra of the Conservatives always, the, the Rankian idea, we just want to tell things as they are. They represented the policy of forced removal as a rescue mission, and they dismissed all talk of an injustice to the Aborigines as an attempt by a new class of self-loathing intellectuals to turn Australia into a pariah state. In the combative style characteristic of the history wars, Peter Howson, a former Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, claimed that the Stolen Generations was in fact nothing more than an ideological invention writing for the conservative magazine Quadrant, he framed bringing them home as just another vehicle for the separatist vision of the left, according to which Australia's Aboriginal people would remain set aside from the rest of Australia forever as a permanent reminder of Australia's shame and illegitimacy within the community of nations. Now, despite claims to the contrary, I think those on the left were, in, uh, were no less and arguably much more troubled by the finding of genocide in bringing them home than their conservative opponents. Sensitive to the way that the accusation worked to conflate colonial Australia with Nazi Germany, 
They pondered whether genocide was in fact the right term to describe what had happened, and if so, how the important moral distinction between forced removal and mass murder might be preserved in the face of their identical classification under international law. So this is work being done by Raymond Gator, Robert Mann, uh, Robert Krieger and Martin, uh, and sorry, Robert Van Krieken, Martin Krieger and Robert Van Krieken. However, in contrast to their conservative opponents, who they accused of being in denial, the left never doubted that a really terrible injustice had occurred. Okay. And in their view, recognition of that injustice was in fact the first and the most important step in our attempt to come to terms with the past. Okay. So in stark contrast to their opponents, they insisted that a sense of shame was not only appropriate, but that it was morally necessary. Okay. Shame, as Raymond Gator put it, was not superfluous to the recognition of the injustice, but it was the very form that this recognition took. And his phrase, which became a kind of important um, reference point for me, he said, without shame, there could be no justice. Now, we all know where the debate went from then. Um, after the National Enquiry, we had a 10-year acrimonious debate about whether there should be an apology or whether there shouldn't be an apology. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, we did get an apology. And it felt like the left had been victorious at, at that kind of moment. The apology, when it was finally delivered by uh, Kevin Rudd, was greeted as a kind of rapturous uh, watershed moment for the Australian polity. He described it, as Kevin Rudd described it, as a moment when a great stain upon the nation's soul was finally removed. Okay. And there's this constant reference in his speech to this idea of it was a new beginning for Australia. We started afresh. Okay. And he actually indicated that this had brought the first two centuries of our settled history to a close. And Robert Mann's equally kind of effusive. He says, it's the sweetest sound in public life that I have ever heard. In the politics of nations, there are a few transcendent moments, and this was one. Okay. Now, I think there are good reasons why the apology ought to be regarded, not just as a victory for the left, but as a victory for justice. Okay. There's a very wide consensus or broad consensus within polit political philosophy now that public apologies or political apologies actually do important work in terms of processes of atonement, that they're not just mere symbols, they actually provide a kind of crucial element of recognition of injustice and they underpin the whole work uh, of restoration or moral repair. Okay. My qualifier is this. If nothing else, however, the, the prominence of the purification motif in the apology in Australia ought to give us some pause for thought. What significance ought to be attached to the fact that it was presented as a means of removing a stain upon the nation's soul? Is its value as an act of moral recognition undermined if it simultaneously serves as a form of ritual cleansing? And what light does this intermixture shed on the desire for reconciliation? And so to put it simply, what is the desire for recon reconciliation actually a desire for, desire for and how does this affect what can be achieved under the auspices of reconciliation? What is the desire that drives reconciliation? Okay. This leads me on to the question of shame and its subterranean uh, connection with narcissism. Okay. For, the de for the decade in which the debate over the stolen generations raged in Australia, Conservative opposition to a national apology was consistently explained in terms of two principal rationales. The first was that it made no sense to hold current generations responsible for the deeds of their ancestors. Uh, and the second one was that, in fact, the practice of forced removal had been well-intentioned, it had been undertaken in, in accordance with the law and in good conscience, and therefore it didn't represent a legitimate object of remorse. And taken together, these two arguments work to invert the moral significance that we conventionally assign to an offer of apology. Rather than a means of righting an injustice from the past, it was suggested an apology would inflict an injustice upon the present. In direct contravention of the moral injunction against holding sons guilty for the sins of the fathers, it would force contemporary citizens to take a blame for a policy over which they had no control. And so we saw John Howard take this position a number of times, and so although he was willing to express his regret, uh, he insisted that there shouldn't be a national apology. Okay. Advocates for an apology responded by suggesting that in matters that concern the political community as a whole, it's necessary to think responsibility differently. That is, to think it outside of the conventional juridical model, and in which only individuals who can be held accountable and only for what they intentionally do. So largely, I think, in sympathy with the post-war work that was done, work that was done by Jaspers and Arendt, 
They argued that it was legitimate to hold citizens collectively responsible for things done in the name of the nation, even when they as individuals played no direct part in them. The precise basis upon which this allocation of responsibility was, uh, was structured varied from case to case. There's a group of scholars who just suggested that affective identification with the nation was enough uh, to acquire this sense of responsibility. Okay, a love of country implicated you in the good and bad deeds of forebears. And then there was a second, slightly more sophisticated version, which represented citizens as sort of carriers and shapers of public norms. And therefore their political agency become responsible not for the commission of past injustices necessarily, but for correcting the structural defects in the political culture that made the injustices possible. So a different kind of relationship of responsibility. But in both of those instances, though, regardless of how the conception of responsibility was construed, both of those um, schools saw that the, um, uh, the appropriate emotional correlate of that kind of collective responsibility for the past was shame and not guilt. Okay? They picked up on Arendt's idea that guilt is always personal. It always goes to the things that I have done myself, whereas shame uh, can go to collectivities. Okay. Shame, uh, all of these scholars thought, was a particularly apposite emotion in this context but it could, because it appears where subjects express a disappointment not about what they have done, not about their acts, but about who they are. Okay. And this is a standard kind of phenomenological distinction that's made between guilt and shame. I feel guilty for what I have done. I feel ashamed of who I am. Okay. Robert Mann suggested that it was this argument, the movement from a guilt framework to a shame framework, which actually succeeded in moving the national consciousness, shifted the national consciousness, and this is the, the move that actually won the apology debate in Australia. Uh, I'm not so sure that that was the move that won the debate. But what it did indicate to me was this sense that there was an underlying faith uh, in shame amongst this group of scholars uh, and that they saw it as the affective manifestation, once again, of a kind of ethical surplus. Okay. What do they mean by that? Danielle Salamire and Michael Flagenblatt ran this argument and really a lovely, lots of insight and subtlety to their claims. They suggested that the feelings of shame aroused by the publication of Bringing Them Home pointed to a sense of responsibility to others that was in excess of conventional legal and moral obligations. Despite the fact that they had nothing to feel guilty about, citizens recognised through their shame that it was incumbent upon them to respond to the pain that had been inflicted on Aboriginal people by their ancestors. Shame was, in effect, their way of acknowledging responsibility, once again, not for specific acts of colonial violence in which they played no part, but for what Salamaya called the moral grammar of the political community that she says serves as the condition of possibility for all such acts. Okay? So shame is about citizens taking responsibility for this moral grammar of the, of the political community. Shame, she said, is the recognition that the identity of the political community has been constituted in such a way as to enable acts of violence against Aboriginal people, and it's also the recognition of the need to refashion that identity so that such acts of violence don't happen again in the future. And this is the point at which I kind of engage in some critical analysis. Whether shame can be trusted to kind of function in this way, I think is something of a moot point. Okay. Theorists of the emotions have assigned ethical significance to shame on the basis that it signals a failure to live up to the socially mediated expectations that we set for ourselves. Okay. Shame can be valuable, they suggest, both as a prospective emotion, that is something which goads us into avoiding action that's likely to cause us humiliation later or embarrassment later, and also a retrospective emotion, one which motivates attempts to improve or to reconstruct ourselves in the wake of some kind of failure. Okay. Bernard Williams has been particularly important in this kind of area. He has a long-standing view that shame is capable of doing ethical work that guilt cannot. Okay. Williams claims that shame, unlike guilt, retains its potency as an ethical motivator even in cases where we're either not directly involved ourselves or where the wrongdoing or injuries we inflict upon others are unintentional. Okay. So in those two cases, he thinks shame can still be a motivator for some kind of reparative action, whereas guilt would leave us with a sense, well, we didn't intend this or we weren't involved in it and therefore we have no responsibility for it. Okay. Okay. The experience of shame, he says, 
speaks to the possibility that there might be something about us, okay, some defect in our character or in our constitution, which makes it possible to, for us to cause harm to others, even in the absence of any intention to do so. Okay. As Nussbaum points out, however, it's precisely this connection between shame and identity that makes it highly unreliable as an instrument of justice. Okay. Okay. Remember, shame is this sense that it goes to the, not to what I have done, not to my acts, it goes to this sense of who I am. So there's a very intrinsic <coughs> connection between shame and identity. Okay. And when I feel ashamed, it's because I feel there's something wrong with my identity. Okay. Shame, as she puts it, involves the realisation that one is weak and inadequate in some way in which one expects to be adequate. Okay? So it appears in cases where subjects, and it can be individual or collective subjects, recognise that they have fallen short of their ideal self, or in the psychoelenic language, their ego ideal, in some kind of fundamental way. Okay? And she says it's not irrelevant that phenomenologically shame is often correlated with this experience of wanting to hide or being un unable to look at oneself in the mirror, can't stand the sight of oneself. Yeah? And she says that in contrast to guilt, which arises out of this sense of having failed others and aims at repairing relationships, shame is inherently self-referential. Uh, yeah? Its only evaluative criteria is the ability to live with oneself. Okay. Now, Williams has a nice kind of gloss on this idea. He says it's not that if we invent standards for ourselves that we then decide we fail to measure up to and then we feel ashamed. He says that the standards against which we measure ourselves and which, if we fail, trigger experiences of shame, these are always socially mediated. And he says, and they're also ethically inflected. It's the judgment upon ourselves, internalised, of someone whose judgments we would respect, he says. So it is a judgment of the self upon the self, but it's a judgment in, in the sense of an externalised or internalised other. Okay. That little gloss aside, though, I think doesn't alter the fact that shame as an experience remains fundamentally inward-looking. Okay. The pain that it entails is at base a pain for oneself. Right? It's a pain for having failed oneself, for having failed to live up to the standards one sets for oneself. So it seems to me that there's no guarantee that the experience of shame will translate in a commitment to justice in which the interests of the other take precedence. Okay. Since what is primarily at stake in shame is the agony of failure, it's just as likely, and I think much more likely, to stimulate efforts to heal the self as it is to heal the other. Okay. Now, in psychoanalytic analytic theory, okay, or psychoanalytically inspired theories of the emotions, the unreliability of shame as an instrument of justice is commonly traced back to its connection with primary narcissism. Okay. And primary narcissism for Freud is the sense of omnipotence, wholeness, perfection that we have uh, as a child. And, and Freud basically develops a, or presents a developmental trajectory by which we move from this primary experience of narcissism in which we have wholeness, perfection, omnipotence, no sense of separation from the mother, to a mature form of narcissism where we present an ego ideal that we try to live up to. Okay, so in his seminal essay on narcissism of 1914, Freud presents the ego ideal, this is the ideal self that we try to live up to, it's the socially mediated set of expectations against which we relentlessly measure ourselves. He presents this as the substitute repository of the self-love that the real ego enjoyed in infancy. Having been forced to abandon his infantile sense of impotence by the relentless assaults of reality, claimed Freud, man seeks to recover the early perfection thus wrested from him in the new form of an ego ideal. So the ego ideal is classically conceived in terms of the interjection of a parental authority figure into consciousness, so the father or, or, or the mother. Okay? And it exercises a kind of powerful attraction in the form of a promise of affirmation or an experience of wholeness and perfection once again. So just as children can be excited to good behaviour by the bestowal of parental love, or perhaps more to the point by the fear of its withdrawals, especially if I'm the parent, adults can be motivated... People who know me will understand that joke. 
So just like children can be kind of motivated to good behaviour by the fear of the withdrawal of parental love, so too, so too can adults, according to Freud, uh, be moved or motivated to be better than themselves or to be their best out of desire to reach and a feel of, fear of falling short of their ego ideal. The point here is that rather than disappearing completely, according to Freud, this experience of wholeness and perfection, which he thought was characteristic of infantile narcissism, remains available even for adults when we succeed in establishing an identity between our ego, our real self, and our ideal self, our ego and our ego ideal. In other words, when we live up to or have a sense of achieving the ideal standards we set for ourselves, we have this kind of abundant feeling of omnipotence, uh, wholeness and perfection. Okay, I will get back to the reconciliation debates in Australia in, in a minute. Freud clearly considered the emergence of this mature, he calls this the mature, a mature form of narcissism, or sometimes it's called secondary form of narcissism rather than primary narcissism. He considers that a vital step in the development of the personality and in the progress of civilization more generally. Okay. Without it, subjects would never rise above the level of base desires and they would never conform to collective standards and norms. But at the same time, he recognised that the creation of the ego ideal remains somewhat ambiguous from a strictly moral point of view. Okay. If it encourages subjects to redirect their, libid their libidinal energy towards the achievement of higher ideals, it also provided a kind of hiding place, this is his words, provides a kind of hiding place for the lost narcissism of childhood. Okay. So the secret force, he says, behind our conformity to standards and norms is our desire for the joyful affirmation of this interjected authority figure. Okay. So contrary to what might first be expected, therefore, he says that upright behaviour, moral behaviour, is intimately connected to this desire to feel complete unto oneself, to regain this primary experience of wholeness and perfection. Okay. So as Freud later pointed out, the sense of triumph that we feel when we measure up to our ego ideal is less a re reflection of a concern with morality for its own sake than a function of its power to recall an earlier experience of wholeness and perfection. Similarly, or conversely, an inability to live up to the ego ideal was likely to be experienced not just as a moral failing, but as a kind of narcissistic defeat. Okay? Failure, in this context, is equivalent to a loss of love for oneself, and the affective manifestation of that loss of love for oneself is shame. Freud was very strongly of the view that this narcissistic impulse could not be overcome, and in fact we thought there was a kind of magnetic pull within our consciousness always back to a primary form of narcissism. And he saw that as being associated with two specific pathologies. First is the refusal of any distinction between self and other, and the second one is a kind of flight from reality and the demands for the external world. So he says we're always being pulled back to that primary experience of narcissism because it's the most satisfying. He also says that we look for surrogates for this experience of primary narcissism and he thought that the nation was one kind of surrogate for this experience of primary narcissism. Okay. So in his late phase when he starts to dabble in the idea of group psychology, he talks about the notion of there being a common ego ideal and that this is what in fact is the glue holding nations together. Okay. The glue that connects us as citizens within a nation is a, an allegiance or a commitment to a common ego ideal. Okay? And he says the same kind of thing works here. Just as the individual can be driven to good behaviour by trying to live up to their uh, ego ideal, so too can the citizens of a nation be driven to conform to law and to act as virtuous citizens by their um, desire to be in conformity with the common ego ideal. But for Freud, this meant that the pathologies associated with narcissism remained very powerfully present within nations, and that those pathologies, once again, the refusal of any distinction between self and other and the flight from the demands of reality, he thought that those pathologies were likely to be exacerbated, come out more in moments of narcissistic defeat. Okay, now I leave Freud. Okay. So whether the revelations of the Bringing Them Home report... okay actually precipitated something like a narcissistic defeat for the citizens of Australia, it's very hard to prove. I want to say it's true, but it's very hard to prove it and it would involve a different kind of methodology than the one that I have. Okay. 
but I think we can nevertheless read for symptoms of this kind of narcissistic defeat. And obviously when there's an accusation of genocide against your nation, it is rather challenging for you, to say the least. At the very least, you would have to say that when a nation is accused of genocide, that it opens up the widest possible gap, you would think, between what is then being described as the reality of the nation and its ego ideal. So if your ego ideal is that you're the land of the fair go, and in fact the reality principle is claiming that you're uh, a genocidal nation, then you've got a serious problem on your hands. Okay? You're as far away from your e ego ideal as you can possibly imagine, and in fact the accusation of genocide is almost equivalent to the claim that this character, this body, is unlovable. It's beyond love. Okay? It's the ultimate negative judgment of the interjected authority figure. So once again, reading the symptoms here, I think evidence that we did undergo some kind of experience of narcissistic defeat was supplied by the bitter controversy over whether we should have an apology to the stolen generations or not. Okay? Danielle Salamaya has suggested that both sides of this contest, the yes for the apology, the no for the apology, seem to intuitively understand that an offer of apology was tantamount to an admission of failure in relation to the national ego ideal. Okay? To say sorry to the victims of forced removal was to concede before the eyes of the world that we were, or that at least we ought to be, ashamed of who we were. And she says, Has the character, had the character of the nation not been bound up with the apology in this way, it would have been difficult to understand why both sides appealed to grand arguments about Australian history in order to prosecute their case. Okay. The fact that they turned history into a battleground upon which to wage war among themselves only went to show, she suggests, how much weight they thought an apology would carry as a pronouncement upon the national identity. Okay. So, in a sense, I think it's because this uh, bring home report precipitates an experience of narcissistic defeat that we end up in a war. Okay? It wouldn't have been a war had the stakes not been so high. In a way, I think, opposition to the apology practically cried out to be understood in narcissistic terms. In the course of the history wars, conservatives frequently announced, as opposed to demonstrated, that they had no motivation other than historical truth. Okay? Unlike those on the left, they argued who had willfully fabricated this saga of shame in order to discredit assimilation, they were committed to understanding the past as it really was. Okay? If anything, however, their rage against the Bringing Them Home report and their ad hominem attacks upon its authors only went to show how deeply they were implicated in the very experience of shame whose merits they denounced. It seems to me that only those who were desperate to defend the reputation of the nation and to ward off this experience of narcissistic de defeat could have appealed to this idea that the moral accounts of the, of the nation were well balanced. Uh, or even more perversely, this was the other move Conservatives made, <clears throat> was to imply that Aboriginal people and their self-loathing supporters had somehow betrayed the Australian nation by speaking out against the generosity of the assimilation program. As Selemeyer and a number of others noted, the resistance to apologising was simply the tip of the iceberg. The ice underneath was the imperative to retain our image of ourselves as the land of the fair go. Okay. That's the opponents to the apology. The motivation of advocates of the apology is a little bit more ambiguous and consequently I think it's been much less subject to critique. Okay. On the one hand, their support for the apology, as for reconciliation more generally, has seemed to speak of a kind of ethical interest in coming to terms with the past. Okay. They recognised that an injustice had occurred and that it was incumbent upon the current generation to do something about it. On the other hand, their pervasive references to shame suggested that the central driver of this interest in coming to terms with the past was once again an experience of narcissistic defeat and the need to overcome it. Okay. If the shock of the stolen generations upon which they so frequently remarked could be partly attributed to ignorance, and we got a lot of this, we didn't know what was going on stuff, if it could partly be attributed to that, the shock was also a kind of pointer to their disorientation, I think, in the face of an unexpected judgment upon the character of the nation. Okay. Even the left didn't quite see this one coming. Okay. By exposing the enormous distance between the real practices of the nation, genocide, and its collective ego ideal, land of the fair go, bringing them home had removed them to a country that they scarcely knew as well. 
And so I see this as being akin to a kind of moment in tragic drama where the hero starts to understand himself in a completely different mode, a uh, different way. It's a kind of moment of tragic recognition where you see something about yourself that you hadn't seen before and it's something that you don't want to see. What's that? Like grey hair. Like grey hair. <laughs> like, grey, hair. <laughs> grey hair might not encourage you to poke out your eyes, but it, <laughs> some mornings I do feel that way. <laughs> I was saying to Crispy earlier that I feel like a young man betrayed by his hair. <laughs> well, I had an appropriate response. It's not entirely true, because I'm also being betrayed by my eyes and my teeth and my ears as well. And I could go on, but I won't. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, you <laughs> realise this will be the only bit of this talk that people will listen to on the podcast. Then we'll go back. So the point I'm trying to, to drive home here is that there's a common kind of pathology underlying both the conservatives and the progressives here, that both responses spring from the same kind of origin, which is the experience of narcissistic defeat. Okay. For the left, it's the pain associated with this tragic recognition about yourself. Okay. And I think that it's possible, in fact, I think it's actually quite likely, that this pain of tragic recognition was partly eased by their critique of conservative denialism. Okay. Well, no one on the left ever pretended that their service in the history wars was enough to cleanse their dirty hands. The sense that it went some way towards restoring pride was in constant evidence. Okay. Among other things, facing up to difficult truths and taking ownership over the past provided that with them with a means of distinguishing themselves, in both senses of that word, from their conservative counterparts. Okay. If the public sacrifices they made on behalf of the truth were not exactly represented as heroic by them, they were very clearly considered to have done themselves and their nation some credit. For them, shame had, somewhat paradoxically, become a badge of honour. Okay. It's a good thing now to embrace shame. That shows that you're on the progressive side of politics. Okay. For all the dignity that it recovered, however, this assault upon the shamelessness of the conservatives was never more than a temporary balm for the narcissistic wound that had been inflicted by the failure of the assimilation project. Okay. For the progressive, for that, I think, for, to, in order to overcome that narcissistic wound, progressives needed some kind of demonstration that the nation was once again worthy of love, that it was, if not forgiven, that at least forgive a bull. Okay. In effect, then, the apology took on precisely the opposite meaning for progressives as it had for conservatives. Okay where the latter, the Conservatives, worried that it would tarnish the reputation of the nation and implicate it in historical injustice. The former, the Progressives, hoped that it would redeem it from shame and pave the way for a reconciliation with Aboriginal people, thereby proving that the nation was worthy of love. The question I want to raise, then, is who was the apology really for? For conventional political philosophy, the answer is kind of self-evident, right? The, the apology is for the people to whom it is addressed. It's for Aboriginal people. However, Freud's account of the narcissistic drive ought to, ought to alert us to the possibility that what an apology ultimately seeks is an adjustment not of the relationship between self and other, but of the relationship between the self and itself. That is, it's seeking an adjustment of the relationship between the ego and the ego ideal. Although an apology is ostensibly directed outwards, in recognition of the suffering caused to another, it may in fact be a means by which the wrongdoer overcomes his or her own wounded narcissism. Okay. Very briefly, I finished the paper by trying to do a quick kind of analysis uh, of the apology. It, it, it's very short, but I try to set myself up against what I think is, was the seminal uh, discussion of the apology by Michael Fagenblatt, in which he says... The apology deserves to be recognised as an ethical gesture precisely because it, risks, it resists the move towards reconciliation and therefore it resists the desire for a kind of narcissistic reinfolding of Aboriginal people back into the white nation. Okay? Okay. Which is an odd reading, but I think probably the most interesting reading of the apology, that it was actually what's, what was ethical about it is that it resisted reconciliation and therefore preserved a sense of difference between self and other. He puts it this way, okay, he says, it's 
the grounds on which it ought to be treated as an ethical gesture rests on, on two things. Firstly, that it involves an exercise of sovereign power in the mode of contrition. And secondly, that it presages a new conception of sovereign power in a mode of interdependence. <laughs> to succeed as an act of atonement, Fagenblatt suggests, the apology required the sovereign to use its exceptional position inside and outside the law, not to exempt itself from legal constraints against violence, but instead to humble itself before the victims of its own excess. So he's suggesting that this is a kind of logic of the exception, a Schmittian logic of the sovereign exempting itself from its own legal foundations, but not in order to exercise violence, but in order to engage in an ethical act. It, uh, sovereign exceptionality in the mode of contrition. Exemplifying exactly what makes this kind of gesture a novum in political history, according to Fagenblatt, the apology expressed the sovereign's capacity to go beyond the law ethically by way of a recognition and critique of its own founding authority. More than simply making exceptional use of this Schmidian logic of the exception, however, the apology also foreshadowed a transformation of sovereignty in a manner of reciprocity and dependence. Okay. Fagenblatt makes a great deal of the fact that in every apology a formal requirement of it is the possibility of non-acceptance. Okay. So he says, although the sovereign in this instance can offer an apology, okay, it's up to Aboriginal people to determine whether they're going to receive, reject, ignore or defer the apology. And therefore, he says, the apology attests to the interdependence of non-Indigenous and Indigenous freedom in Australia and therefore to a different kind of model of shared sovereignty. Okay. I think you don't need to twist Fagenblatt's argu argument very much to grasp that the reputation that the apology enjoys as, as a transformative gesture or an ethical gesture rests upon the way in which it overcomes the narcissistic pull towards perfection and wholeness. Okay. So from his perspective, the apology deserves to be regarded as a watershed, firstly, because it provides an explicit acknowledgement of the imperfections of the nation, and secondly, because it resists the desire to redeem the nation through reconciliation. By assuming the, the, the debased position of the perpetrator, according to Flagenbat, the Australian state made it clear that it no longer wished to conceal or to deny the structural flaws in its political culture, its apology for past injustices indicated that it explicitly placed itself among the fallen. At the same time, the apology pointed to a mature understanding of the inherently reciprocal nature of relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in settler societies. By making itself dependent upon their acceptance of the apology, the state recognised that Aboriginal people are independent of the nation and unlikely to be ever fully assimilated into it. In short, the apology worked as an ethical gesture, not by facilitating the project of reconciliation, according to Flagenblatt, but by deferring and disrupting it. Okay. Rather than secure unity through the intimacies of confession and forgiveness, the apology imposed a sense of difference through the possibility of non-acceptance, effectively thwarting the narcissistic wish for the nation to be complete unto itself. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Contestable interpretation, but a, a fascinating one nevertheless. I find it very attractive, but I don't think it actually is sufficiently attentive to the narcissistic claims that were made on the apology. And there's really only kind of two critical points that I raise here. The first one is, how is it that we ended up with an apology in the first place? Okay. In other words, one of the first way in which the narcissistic drives makes itself present here is by the narrowing down of the reparative options towards an apology. The accusation is genocide, we end up with a reparation of apology. That seems like a mismatch, <laughs> to say the least. Okay. Now, but to the best of my knowledge, Raymond Gate is the only scholar to have wondered why, given the findings of bringing them home, that criminal trials remained unthinkable in Australia. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's not an advocate of retributive justice in, the, in this context, but he sets up a very interesting position, he says, it's not until these trials become thinkable in Australia that we would have truly grasped the enormity of what had happened. Okay. Now, I think that's a kind of really useful insight, and if you work backwards from it and say, okay, the apology, if that becomes a reasonable response to this injustice, then it would seem to exert a kind of neg negative pressure on the injustice, okay, a backward pressure on it. If apology is an appropriate response to it, then maybe it's a lesser injustice than genocide. 
Okay? In other words, forcing it down the pathway of an apology is to force it into a category, to force the wrong into a category that doesn't prevent the Australian nation from becoming unlovable. It moves it out of that category of the unlovable. In other words, it allows recovery from narcissistic defeat. Okay. So one problem I think is one way in which the narcissistic impulse is evident is in the fact that we end up in apology. The other way I think is that it actually forecloses on the thing that Fagenblatt thinks is crucial to it, which is the possibility of non-acceptance. Okay. Fagenblatt hinges everything on the possibility of non-acceptance. That's where difference inserts itself into this gesture of apology. I think the apology in Australia actually foreclosed on that possibility of non-acceptance. Okay? It actually became its own fulfilment. Okay? The apology was instantaneously the moment in which Australia was reconstituted uh, and was born again. Okay? And as I said before, this is the language that filters all the way through Rudd's apology speech. It's the beginning anew and so forth. Okay? So, so rhetorically, at least, the performance of the apology became a kind of transcendent moment, turning Australia instantaneously into a fully united and fully reconciled people. So somewhat perversely, it seems to me, the apology actually provided the conservatives who railed against it for 10 years exactly what they'd always wanted, which is a nation reborn in the image of its own perfection and wholeness. Okay, I've finished here. So... Perhaps it could be argued, political philosophers might want to argue, Fagenblatt might want to argue, that the apology in Australia was performed in a manner that was inconsistent with its ethical core as a gesture and consequently ought not to be regarded as an apology at all. But even if that should turn out to be the judgment of political philosophy, I'm not sure that it gets us very far politically. It seems to me that the more urgent task is to try to come to terms with the force that distorts it as an ethical gesture, and which turns it into a vehicle for what Martha Nussbaum calls narcissistic fusion. That's what I think the apology was, an attempt to rejoin Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this kind of narcissistic fusion. One of the things we learn from reading Freud, I think, maybe not from my reading of it, but from reading Freud, and also I think from the Greek tragedies that he read, uh, is that the pressure exerted by the experience of narcissistic defeat cannot be underestimated. Okay, we get classic examples in Greek tragedy of Ajax and Oedipus that shame drives subjects to extraordinary feats and extraordinary follies for the simple reason that it's driven by this inability to live with yourself. Okay? And the problem with shame that these cases highlight is not simply that it's unpredictable, that it can trigger acts of rage as well as acts of reparation, but also that it remains tied to this kind of narcissistic logic in ways that inhibit the transformation of relations between self and other. So even in cases where subjects are driven to reconstitute themselves in the wake of this experience of failure, it's the healing of their own narcissistic wounds that remains uppermost in their consideration. So I try not to conclude that reconciliation is the same thing as assimilation um, from this analysis. I don't think they're the same because I think a wedge is driven between those things by a consciousness of failure. Yeah? The project of assimilation was conceived also in terms of national unity. It was motivated, I think, by an unreflected as opposed to a wounded pride. Assimilation was nothing if not unapologetic. And I think that's partly why we were blind to the violent nature of the means by which we were prosecuting assimilation. In a way, however, I think it's the failure of that project and the sense of shame that it's engendered that has, in fact, intensified the desire for unity. Okay. If the incorporation of Aboriginal people into the Australian state was once seen as a gift to them, I think it's now seen as a kind of salvation for us. What kind of nation would it have to be, after all, if Aboriginal people, in full consciousness of past mistakes, were willing to reconcile it? This is kind of, it would prove that we were lovable. The problem with reconciliation, then, may not be that we are hostile to it, but that we want it too much. And this is not to say that nothing good can ever come of reconciliation or, or that an apology is, is better, not better than a not apology. But I think we do need to reflect a little bit more deeply about the desire for reconciliation, where it comes from, and whether it's driven ultimately perhaps by a kind of regressive desire just not to carry the stain of colonisation anymore. Mm -hmm.